All right. Um, tonight, I want to begin the bridge to the good stuff. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start laying the foundation in the prodigal son story. I believe that the prodigal son story is an eternal template, is an eternal template. I believe it's not just a little story about something Jesus made up. You know, well, let me think of a parable. Okay. I believe that it, it has its roots uh, right at the very beginning with Adam. Um, I mean, I can just go through. I mean, Abel and Cain, Abraham, just Abraham, much less Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob, Esau, just keep going right on through the, the children of Israel in bondage in Egypt. Just an amazing spread of reality that just picks up momentum as it goes. And these different stories add parts and pieces as it goes. And it is, um, it is getting, you know, it's getting to the Father's heart. It's getting to the real issues. And, of course, it goes without saying that it is, you know, all through the New Testament. So um, our subject is the Father and two sons. And uh, so turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy 21. By now, most of you, at least a third of you, know the story of the prodigal son. So I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty confident rushing past reading that right now. <clears throat> All right. And so one of the things to realize is that in Jewish society, the laws regarding inheritance were very specific. We're going to read some of them here. Um, but they dealt with how the inheritance was to be divided among the heirs. And um, the, we'll read this, but the elder son gets two-thirds, or what is actually what he gets is what's called a double portion. The elder son gets a double portion. And the younger son gets a single share. So let's read. Deuteronomy 21, verse 16 and 17. When he wills his property to his sons, he may not treat as firstborn the son of the loved one in disregard of the son of the unloved one who is older. Instead, he must accept the firstborn, the son of the unloved one, and allot to him a double portion of all he possesses, since he is the first fruit of his vigor, the birthright is his due. All right, so if you're astute (laughs) uh, and you know the word of God, you know that this, this law right here in these two verses has been violated over and over and over again, right up to the prodigal son, okay? So we're going to have to we're going to have to discover some things. We're going to have to discover some real things in the heart of God or we're going to always be stuck trying to trying to sort out what is going to be hitting us uh, chapter after chapter through Genesis, book after book in the Old Testament including going and getting into Jeremiah, Hosea, Amos, Micah. (laughs) Because it's there too. And it's all brought up in in the true heart and pattern of what the Lord has in mind. So, uh, as the scripture says, 
the, uh, you know, it's the prodigal son. It's a story of two sons. It's a father with his sons. And the, the important thing to remember at this stage is that the elder son is supposed to get a double portion. Okay? All right. And this, the other son, this is uh, just for you guys who just came in. We were in Deuteronomy 21, 16, and 17. And we're just looking at the laws of inheritance. So these scriptures that I just mentioned, this passage is talking about this uh, talking about a man, any man in that sense. Um, and it is talking about his two sons. And again, in this case, the elder gets two thirds and the younger gets one third. So um, let's go back now to Luke 15. Luke 15, starting with verse 11. <clears throat> And he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. This portion of scriptures is just incredible as we make it across this bridge. Um, in this parable, the younger son demands something. He asked for the share of property that falls to me. Verse 12. What is he asking for? He's asking for his inheritance. This has to do with inheritance. And he's asking for his inheritance. Um, and so, to just make that clear, he's asking for one third of the property that the father has, okay? And he's asking for that right now. I don't know if you noticed the wording, but it says, not many days after the younger son gathered all together, he took one third of the father's possessions and he left, okay? Now, here is the kicker. The son wants his inheritance before death, before the father has died. Well, I mean, we know that, you know, it talks in Hebrews about the inheritor, you know, the testator has to die first before you get that. But the prodigal son was not thinking in, in that realm. He was um, not thinking that, you know, maybe the father would still need this because he's still alive. Didn't have any consideration for his father, for the things that his father had brought about, um, and just took off just not many days after that. I wrote down, would you allow your son to walk in, gather up one third of what you own and leave? You know, just show up and say, I want my inheritance now. Say, well, I'm still pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> and then get up and leave. So, this is an outrageous request. I mean, it, it is, uh, even in you know, our times, 
much less way back then because back in those days, you know, the family and the father was highly honored. But it was, it was outrageous for him to do this. And, um, you know, it was the equivalent of saying, Father, I can't even wait for you to die. I, I'm sorry, I can't wait for you to die. I want the stuff I'm supposed to get. Wow. Man, you know, give me one of everything, one third of everything that you worked hard for to bring about, and I want it now. Okay? You know, I can just see him standing before the Father and saying this, and he's saying it, and do it now. Okay? So, um, my next subtopic, and I, there's, I'm going to have this because it is an ongoing bridge that we're crossing here to really get to where we want to go. And I don't know how, how long it'll take me to finish laying out this bridge, but it's in, the bridge is so important. Even the th You can see how the things I've already said are like, whoa, that's way worse than I, I thought, you know. And so this, this one, this subtitle is called waiting on, Not Waiting on Death. Not Waiting on Death. Okay? So the younger son, he couldn't wait for his, his inheritance. He couldn't wait for the father's proper order. Okay, let it sink in. He couldn't wait for the father's proper order order he changed the order okay so uh, Galatians chapter 4 of course verse 1 beginning with verse 1 I'll read it if you don't you know you don't have your Bible to look it up or whatever verse 1 now I say that the heir meaning the the inheritor as long as he is a child meaning one who is immature Differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Now, you must realize that when it used the word heir, this is talking about the dividing of the inheritance. That this isn't just talking about you're under tutors and governors because you're a Christian until you grow up. It is until you understand the Father's heart and you understand the Father's timing and you understand his plan and you are flowing with something that is above you and not just you down on the earth. That there was, it is as if there was something brought in from the, from the word of God and from the heart of God to the earth to set things in motion but a particular motion, a particular order that is according to the, to the heart of God. And I, I say that because it's according to the being of God. And that's one of the things we want to discover when we get across the bridge, how incredibly that this, how this is just massively sweeps across just, you know, just about every book of the Bible and chapter after chapter as we, as we begin, um, and it is related to the being of God who is not subject to any rules like the Ten Commandments or this or that or the rule of being fair or the rule of this and that. He is subject. The Father is subject to one rule and one rule only. He wants his son out of this. And it's, it's going to be proven. I mean, I can say it up here and we're going to be amen. But when you just start going like this, and then there you go, oh my God, I should probably take this serious. <laughs> well, you probably should, because it's the basis of so much. Um, <clears throat> verse 2, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, when we were immature, and what does that mean? Um, 
I once said to somebody, um, they asked me, should they take a certain position um, within the church? And I said, um, and that position didn't really have anything to do with, with me or me saying something, they were just asking me. And they said, um, should I take that position? And I said, well, and this was to a person who was really young, really young. And I said, well, the scripture says not to a novice, not to someone who is new at this, but to, you know, that we need to mature. And there's a maturity that is not, we all know this, there's a maturity that is not just learning how to pray or how to baptize or how to, um, uh, lead a, a class or to teach teach something or you know on and on and on the whole religious gamut but rather um, rather wait till you mature in the Lord and you found out things for yourself not just taught things and uh, this person ended up taking that position uh, and when it was brought up said to me um, well on my job I've learned how to lead people <laughs> oh, this is, you know I didn't say anything I just felt not to say anything but it was you know just a complete misunderstanding of the scriptures and of what maturity is maturity is not uh, being able to, you know, do major things or lead groups of people or whatever uh, it is to know the Lord to such a degree that you are led more of him than you're led of you. Is that a better way of saying it? That'd make a good leader. <laughs> that's, that's what a good leader is, that you are led more of him than you are led of you. And so... Um, there is this time, there is this time appointed of the Father. And what, okay, so the interesting thing here is it takes, he takes someone who is immature. They may be 50 years old. The father back then could be 150 for that matter. But they, the, he takes his son and he puts him with the, the teachers and the tutors and the governors and he's treated like a servant. Because God is looking for something. Now, this is important because this is gonna, this is gonna, this answer is gonna come to the top in story after story after story after story after story. The Father is waiting for something specific. And we can say His Son, but guess what? It's not just his son that we can say, well, I just want his son. You know, I'm glad some of you know what I'm talking about. It is that reality of the nature and way of Christ that can proceed through you. Because we all have the son, but we don't all function. Our mind is not all renewed to the son, and we make mistakes, or we do, we, we, we injure or wound is a better word. We wound the Father over and over because we're sonless, if you will. You know, I'm not saying we don't have this. I'm saying we're sonless in our, in our minds. Our mind hasn't been renewed to, to the Son, um, and our ways are not after his kind. And so <clears throat> the Father knows us better than we know us. He knows us better than we, and he knows the son better than we know the son. And he knows if we're getting close or if we're us. You know, and I'm not talking about being an evil person. <laughs> I'm talking about maybe a very good loving, compassionate person that wants to help people, but if, it's, if, it, if it proceeds out of us, maybe I can just answer this since my time just ran out. 
I got a, a thing from somebody recently that said, so where does, where does fruit come in? Where does you know, that come in? And my thought was, you know, okay, there's this vine. You know, if, if I had a piece of chalk, but we, we don't have enough time. But if the, we have this vine, and inside of it is this life. Okay? And then we take a branch that doesn't have that life in it and we graft it in. We wound it and we, we, we're cut off from something. So there's a death and there's a wounding to get us into this life. And that life comes into us and it starts flowing out of us. And that life knows when to produce fruit. And here's how you can tell the difference between fruit and works. Fruit is the express and specific result of vine life in us. And works is our good ideas. <laughs> and our want to a lot of times and our abilities that we want to offer up and all of that. And just like, just like the prodigal son, maybe a branch is not waiting on the death to fully take so that the life can come into it, another life, and produce. Amen. Okay, let's stop and we'll come back in just a few minutes.